you ever have one of those moments in life where, where you just have this sense that everything is as it should be, where everything feels right? My, my family and I, we, we uh, have a, a long-standing tradition since I was a kid of vacationing um, on the beach in South Carolina. We do it almost every summer. Um, it's one of our most favorite times. And I, I remember specifically a few years ago, after many hours of driving and, and everything that comes with that, that first morning where you get the kids up early and, and, and they're just all excited and you head out to the beach. And I can, I can tangibly remember walking out and the excitement on, on my three daughters' faces as they see the ocean and they're running out there and, and the, the sand in my feet and, and the cool breeze coming off the water and the sunshine on my face and my beautiful wife walking next to me and my heart was sort of like filled up and I'm thinking this is, this, everything is right in the world right now. You know, in that moment feeling like everything is as it should be. Um, and, then, and then I look over and see one of my daughters tackling one of my other daughters because they uh, claim that they saw she, she shell, seashell first. Or, uh, uh, you know, my wife running over to wipe the sand out of one of the kids' eyes after the, the uh, retribution sand throw and, and right back to reality, like, really quickly. Um, but in that moment, it seemed like everything was functioning as it was designed to function, how it was supposed to be. And I think that these moments, if, if you've been there, I think that these moments reveal something about us. I think they expose a, a longing or a desire for that which once existed and now we can't quite seem to rediscover. It's almost a glimpse of, of what John Milton uh, famously referred to in the poem Paradise Lost. We have and, and are now continuing our series entitled The Story of God. A study of, of Genesis and Exodus and of God's overall grand redemptive narrative. And we've been looking at the creation account together in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And, and we looked from the very beginning in Genesis 1 how established in, in, in the very center of the story is the person and the character of God. How it is about Him and His work and that which He accomplishes. How he speaks and creates with the power of his word. How he's a relational God. How, how he expands out of his creative activity the circle of those who can relate to him and be in a relationship with him. We saw God create humankind. Where, where he embeds his own image into them. And, and unlike all of the rest of his creative activity, he, he places there an intrinsic value and worth, a capacity that doesn't exist anywhere else. He says it's very good. We looked at God's creation of rest. By the way, it's extremely refreshing not to be preaching from a treadmill. I'll say <laughs> at the outset. We looked how... The, the culmination of his creative activity where, where God sets apart the seventh day and he calls it holy. Where he tends to our souls and, and we meet to create time and space to, to be with him. And now we enter into this part of the story, this, this passage that is somewhat unique and I think a little bit challenging, this portion of of Genesis chapter 2, where we get this description of the environment that God has created and, and placed Adam in. Let's pick things up in, in Genesis chapter 2. It's a description of how things should be, where, where everything feels right, almost. Adam eventually realizes that he's a little lonely, and that's the end of Gen uh, Genesis 2. But let's turn there. We're going to pick things up in 2 verse 8. And it says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put a man whom he had formed. 
And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pashon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havlah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the the second river is the Gahon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in, that day, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. This text is so descriptive. It, it, it gives us a, a window into this creative purpose of God, how things were designed, how things were meant to be prior to sin entering the picture. And I think what we gather here is a description of beauty and of boundaries. Of beauty and boundaries. Let's take a moment to consider the beauty of this text. And as I refer to, to the beauty, what I see is this reflection here in Genesis chapter 2. How we discover this beauty is through these provisions that God places here. Is how the beauty manifests itself. I think we see it discovered in a couple of ways. First, I think we see God's provision for Adam's needs. We see his provision for Adam's needs. Verse 9 says, Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant for sight and good for food. As the text describes here the garden, you immediately get this sense of God's provision for Adam. Trimper Longman, who is a a professor and scholar, writes this. He says that that, that Eden, whose very name means abundance or luxury, indicates that God provides for all of humanity's needs and more when they're first created. There's this sense of overflow or abundance. The garden here is described as, as Adam's domain, the place where he experiences the blessing of God's creation. Again, I think this is extremely important for us as we think about and consider as we build our understanding of of the nature and character of God. And I alluded to this earlier, but right here in the very beginning as we see this description of Eden in the garden, we discover at the very core of who God is, is that He is a generous God. It doesn't indicate that, that, that this garden is ample or that it's satisfactory, that, that it's all right. No, the text describes it as as abundant, as overflowing. More than just merely meeting a need, God is blessing Adam. He's generously giving to him by giving above and beyond that which is simply necessary. I remember as a, a high school student, I had traveled to Albania with my high school basketball team. I went to a Christian high school and we were doing ministry over there shortly after communism had fallen in in uh, Albania and apparently the diet over there uh, didn't sit well with me or something like that so I had lost um, quite a bit of weight while I was there and I I remember I'd finally returned from my trip and I was driving to church and while we were driving I passed my grandma and grandpa on the road going by and apparently at 50 miles an hour my grandmother got a glimpse of me um, and immediately became concerned because when we went over to her, lo- her house for lunch immediately following church that morning, the spread on the table was enough for 50 people. Grandma had made every ounce of food that she had in her house and t- fully expected me to eat all of it. This is kind of the picture that we get here in Genesis. God's provision for Adam isn't just enough. It- it's this abundance, this overflow. It's his graciousness. It's his blessing upon Adam at the core of this provision is the tree of life in verse 9 
also referred to or, or sort of uh, original in the text is, is the tree of youth. It's what God provides Adam and Eve that makes death unnecessary. They can go to the tree of, of life. So God has not only now given out of His abundance, He's provided, He's blessed them, but He does so in such a way that they can experience it with Him for all eternity. We'll come back to this in, in a bit. And see, as we see this description of, of what existed prior to sin entering the picture, it should give us hope. It, it should inspire us because this is what we will see God working to restore, to return us to this place. This is what awaits us. There's, uh, uh, Paul draws on this same sort of theme in, in the book of Romans. This is Romans chapter 5, but you're going to see here, Paul utilizing the same idea as that which was and is no more because of sin, which I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here because we'll talk about that in, in a couple of weeks. But Paul talks about then what happens through Christ. This is verse uh, 12 through 15. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but, not, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those whose sinning was not the type of transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But here it is. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespasses, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. So you see Paul going back there, but now he points us to Jesus, back to the abundance and the overflow of what God is going to do and will do through His grace. He's, he's not only talking about what was, but now he's saying what is in Jesus. He's pointing us back to Genesis, to, to what God had created. He points us back to the tree of life. And he's saying ultimately one day it's going to be restored again in the person of Jesus Christ. In addition to the provision there for Adam's needs, though, we also discover that God provides, there is a provision of his presence. The provision of his presence. It's interesting to note that here in, in the text that, that there is a distinction between Eden and the garden. In verse 8, it says, And the Lord planted a garden in Eden. In verse 10, it says, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And just as we discussed earlier, the garden is sort of described as, as Adam's kind of dwelling place, where he is experiencing, taking in all of this generosity that God is lavishing on him. Eden, however, is described as the place where God dwells. It is his presence here on earth with Adam. This vivid imagery here in the text is, is clear. It is from God's presence that life is given. These rivers that, that flow. Adam is experiencing. He's living in the very presence of God. I think as we take in and think about the significance of the beauty that we're looking at in this text, we feel it so severely, especially when we Think of it in context of, of the fall that's coming in Genesis chapter 3 because the consequences are so evident. It's so obvious to us. This doesn't sound like our experience or what we see unfolding around us. Here in the text, and, and there's a lot that, that we could go into here, but suffice it to say that there is a lot of temple imagery that, can, that is contained here in the creation narrative. And the text, and God sort of reigning in His temple. We were, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we looked at how the psalmist used some of that same language. Or Ezekiel chapter forty-seven kind of captures that same sort of of description. So Adam is not only experiencing the abundant overflow of God's provision for his needs; he is experiencing in relationship with the very God. He's living in His presence. The nature of this relationship here is, is clear in the text. They're not presented as equals who are coexisting. 
Adam is, is completely dependent on the provision of God. But despite all of that, God takes up residence here in Eden. He, he dwells with him in the perfect and, and untainted by sin kind of way. And this is back in Romans chapter 5. If we go back there real quick, and I, I, I just want to take a moment to, to demonstrate this. But it's, it's a reflection of the power of the gospel because Paul does something I think here that is it's hard to wrap our heads around. This is verse 17. So that same text that we were looking at a little while ago, he says, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Did you see those two words? Much more through Jesus Christ. So he sort of takes Adam as the standard, right? This is what was, and, and he says, here's what happened as a result of the fall. And he says, how much more will we reign through Jesus Christ? That's almost difficult for me when I picture what, what we see here in Genesis chapter 2 to wrap our head around. But this is what Paul's saying. This is the power of the gospel in our lives, that the relationship that we experience with Jesus, now he's saying how much more than what it was. What it is now with Jesus, that he takes us there, the relationship that we can have with him. Thirdly, I think we see the provision of purpose. The provision of purpose. In verse 15, it says that the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now here in the text, Adam's role, his part in all of this is clarified. He is there to work and to keep the garden, and there's a couple things that I, I, I just want to point out here real quickly. Adam is given a, a purpose, a work to do prior to sin entering into the picture. I think that's important for us to take notice of. I think I oftentimes think of that as a result of, of the fall or the consequences of sin, and, and we'll see shortly that there are consequences associated with our work. But Adam here is placed in the garden with a purpose. He has a job to do prior to sin entering the picture in Genesis chapter 3. The implication here is important that, that you and I, along with Adam, that we were given, designed with kingdom purpose, kingdom work to do from the very outset. The second thing that, that I want to point out here has to do with the nature of the work that Adam is given. Oftentimes when I think about this text, I sort of conjure up like agricultural imagery in my head. That Adam is out there pulling weeds or, I don't know if weeds existed prior to the fall, or tilling the, the, the garden or, or whatever it is that he's doing. That's kind of what comes to my mind. But I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, of temple imagery and understanding that is inherent here in the, the creation narrative. It's helpful for me when I think about this text to think about it in terms of almost like priestly terms that we see in the Old Testament. The second term uh, 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 used for Adam's work here is to keep it, to, to guard it or protect it. We'll soon discover what it is that he is there to guard and protect it from. Adam is, is given a responsibility. And there is an application here for you and I that we don't want to miss. As we think about the role that we play in God's kingdom work here and now. The responsibility that God has placed in our own lives and faith. John Walton, who is the uh, same professor from Wheaton that we've had out recently in order to explain some of how to understand, how to read the Old Testament. In his commentary on Genesis, he talks about this understanding and applying Adam's work in our own lives in two kind of major areas. He talks about fighting for purity, that guarding against, that, that, that standing at the gate, being the gatekeeper in our lives, um, in our churches around us. And second, he talks about maintaining an environment, a, 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 a routine of worship where we can continue to meet with God. He, he, he talks about 
that which Adam was uh, given to do and how we continue to live that out in our own lives. So throughout all this text, throughout all of these verses, now there's this picture of beauty, this, this picture of provision of God's Provision of Adam's need, his provision of his presence, and, and his provision of purpose. But then there's also a very clear line, uh, and that is a, a line of boundaries. A line of boundaries. Back in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. I feel like this verse stands in like stark contrast to everything that has been coming and proceeds it. There's just this beautiful description of, of all that is surrounding Adam, of where God has placed him. And then seemingly out of nowhere, there's this stark kind of halt. This verse stands out in so many ways and there are there are statements of, of provision, of God's blessing, and then there's boundaries. As we think about this, this verse here, this is the first law or command in Scripture. And it is, with it comes a penalty for, for breaking it. And the penalty is clear, it's, it's death. The first question that comes to mind when I think about this is just simply why? Like, why, why does God place the tree here to begin with? Wouldn't things have been so much simpler if you just put the tree of life and forgot about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And the answer, of course, is because it's necessary. For Adam to be fully human, it's necessary. Derek Kinman, a professor and pastor from England, points out in an article that he writes about the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And he, he talks about how it had to be there. He writes, and he says, God had made humanity in His image and after His likeness. Humankind was like God in the sense that it could love and think and communicate. There was now a test was going to be made. Human beings would not be truly human unless there was some test to determine their faithfulness to God. God therefore set apart one tree from the other trees and forbade humankind to eat of that tree. You get the point. For, for Adam to be fully human, for us to be fully human, then we have to have the ability to choose God or to choose not God. God places that here in the midst of the garden. It's a reflection. It's incumbent upon His image in our lives. And I think, I, I think the second point to, to draw out here and that I so often miss is that really the boundary is just the fourth provision. It is just yet another provision of God. Our natural instinct is always to think about a boundary as somebody withholding something. I mean, think about it in your own life, where you experience boundaries, whether it's in a spiritual sense or just even in life in general. Don't we always sort of assume that somebody's placed that there in order to keep something from us? In order to keep us from experiencing some kind of fun or something that they want to hold on to? I mean, there is something inside of me every time I see a boundary that says, I want to go over there. I want to go past that. You know, it's like those danger high voltage signs He's like oh you're keeping all the electricity back there you know like you're you're holding something from us but we know that's not the case we know that those are there as a provision to to pr protect and this is like exactly what god is doing and this is by the way one of the great lies of our culture currently is that a boundary is is meant somebody's keeping something from you and it's very very possible that somebody's trying to protect you from something and we certainly know in the case that when God provides him, his heart is not to withhold. As a matter of fact, here in the text, we've already seen him provide abundantly above what we can even imagine or think. But, but God provides a boundary as a provision of life. That obedience would bring freedom and that disobedience would ultimately bring death. So here in 
in Genesis chapter 2, we have this description of what was. What it was like when Adam walked with God and he dwelt with him and, and provided everything that he needed. Including shortly, as we'll see next week, Eve. Which was another significant provision. This is a hard text for us. Because we don't live in Genesis chapter 2. We saw, as Paul talks about, that, that the relationship that we have, as he talks about in that Romans passage, that, that what is available to Christ uh, through Christ to us. This is a description of what was. Paul gives us insight into what is now what we can have in Jesus. But Revelation comes back to this. Because it's going to point us back to the work that God will do, how He restores once again the relationship that we can have with our Creator God. This is Revelation chapter 22, the last book of the Bible. The, the first two verses of this chapter and the last chapter of that book. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, and also on the other side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were healing the nations. They're the healing of the nations. Does it sound familiar? Here in Genesis chapter, or excuse me, in Revelation chapter 22, we see the restoration of that which God provided in Genesis chapter 2. We see what was. We know in Jesus what is. And at the end, it will be restored. What it will be. What is available in Him. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer this evening? Father, may we experience anew the provision of Your grace. Of the relationship that is available to us through you. What you describe, what Paul describes in Romans is as much more. Or maybe we, may we live in light of that as we wait for what Revelation 22 tells us is yet to come. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.